Hello, I'm John Janarone, Editor-in-Chief of CorpGov here at the Tulane Conference in New Orleans, Louisiana, with Bruce Goldfarb, who is President and CEO of Okapi Partners. Bruce, thanks for being back with us. Great to see you, John. Always great to be with you. All right. So um, let's talk about the state of shareholder activism right now. Um, you know, one thing in particular that I've noticed is that you've got a lot of macro factors that companies are struggling with, um, still inflation, rates are still elevated. Um, does that lead activists to you know, pursue companies if those, if those are external factors that are hitting everybody? Externalities tend to impact campaigns in, in ways that are subtle. Ah. It, because for a company who still underperforms the situation, the company can use the externalities ah. as an excuse. But ultimately, when you dig into the reality of the company, you, you can't make an excuse for your underperformance, and that's where activists dive in. Yeah. And so what we're experiencing right now are companies who will say, well, there were factors that were beyond our control, and the entire market yeah. was impacted, whether it's inflation or they want to blame COVID or they can still try to blame El Nino once in a while. It just <laughs> it doesn't really matter when as an organization, you are underperforming your peers, your business plan is not effective or understood by the market, and you're gonna still get activists. Make, makes a lot of sense. So setting aside those external factors, let's talk about contested M&A. So a company announces a transaction, activists tend to swarm around, check it out, decide whether they like it or not, right? For sure. What we, what we see again and again is that activists who do their own valuation yeah. Of, of every one of these situations will look and say, is this the best deal for the shareholder? And frequently it may be the best deal, but they're just checking the tires, making sure it's inflated the right way. Yeah. On the other hand, they're still going to say, maybe there's a little more here. Yeah. And so you'll get activists who say, we don't like the deal. Sometimes they're just saying we don't like the price yeah. and they recognize it might not be a bad deal ultimately. Yeah. And especially if there's still going to be some publicly traded company, then people can rally around the situation. With private equity, on the other hand, the activists are frequently saying, not always, but frequently, we don't like the deal because we think the buyer is getting a way better deal than what it's worth in the public markets. And so that's going to continue. It, it, that, that never goes away. It's part of the reason that we set up Okapi Partners in 2007, 2008, because you had this wave of transactions that were announced and there was always an investor who you know, would put their money where they put their mouth where their money is right, right. And, and say, you know, we think there's more here. And we continually see that wave. Now, right now, it's a little bit slower in that kind of market. For here, externalities do matter in the M&A market. Yeah. Um, but whenever there are deals, people are going to you know, kick the tires. Gotcha. Um, how about executive comp? I'm just thinking out loud here. We saw yeah. um, Blackstone paid Schwartzman a billion dollars. Um, don't have to talk about that case in particular. But when you see crazy numbers like that, is that enough to get activists worked up? You know, comp in and of itself is not what gets activists motivated to look into a company. It's comp coupled with underperformance. Right. And so shareholders, by and large, agree that if you perform well for them, you should perf you should be compensated for it. Even big numbers. Now there are there are certainly investors, and it seems to hit the radar screen of the proxy voting advisory firms when you have these outsized numbers. And we do have political pressure now on the billionaire set, and so people look at those numbers and they say, "Wow, there is there an issue?" Yeah. On the other hand, if if the company's doing well for shareholders, you know, more power to you. That's America. You know, it's funny, funny you say that's America. I was working in London several years ago at the Wall Street Journal, yeah. and I remember asking my colleagues, why are you guys writing about this guy getting paid 10 million pounds? Like, whatever. And they're like, okay, yeah, it's great. It's just like America, but he can get rich. I think there is a cultural difference in Europe. Is that fair? By the way, you have an office there. Well, yeah, yes, thank you. Uh, we do have an office in London. I, I 
compensation is viewed a little differently outside of the United States. Yeah. With that in mind, it's still not going to be the factor that drives activism okay. unless performance is in the line with the comp. Interesting. Um, let's talk about this anti-woke movement. Uh, Bruce, you were at our annual conference, and I believe we interviewed someone from Public Square who built a whole company around being anti-woke. But there are also anti-woke activists now, which is kind of the inverse of this ESG activism, right? There's a little bit of uh, activism that's focused on how, what companies say. Yeah. And, and again, it still goes back to how they perform and whether it's an impact on performance. I mean, there are certainly examples in recent proxy fights where the ENS component, whether pro or con, yeah. becomes a factor in the campaign. And we, we are in a moment now where the, po the political winds are saying in some states, yeah, we, we like these ideas. We like our, our companies to be able to talk about the issues that impact their stakeholders. Yeah. And in other states, we're saying we only want you to be focusing on situations that impact the value of your shares. Now, in in this instance, I because I have clients who do all of these things, yeah. I, I, I'll keep my opinions to myself, except to say that in some instances, either campaign makes sense. That when you look at the company and you look at what the company is doing, it may make sense that the stakeholder issues are going to impact value or create a real risk to value. And in those instances, you can either go too far one way or the other, and you have to drive back to the middle. Make Makes sense. Um, can we zero in on the S in ESG, maybe Starbucks is a good case in point to talk about. What's going on there? So Starbucks had a proxy fight with the SOC and we represented the SOC. We represent them in that campaign. The meeting's coming up in a week. However, the SOC announced that they were withdrawing their campaign because the underlying factors that led to the campaign was largely about human capital management. Um, have in some cases hit a point where there's movement toward a real resolution. And so Starbucks had been a company that has been viewed as quite progressive yeah. and a company that where they said, our employees are partners. Yeah. And yet when some of these partners wanted to unionize, Starbucks was very much opposed to the process. And so the the intransigence yeah. or the lack of ability for the sides to negotiate together ultimately led to the thought that and and one that you know we we believe on behalf of our clients that there was a loss of value to Starbucks if you looked at Starbucks and you looked at the market if you looked at they underperformed the S&P, they underperformed the indices in the restaurant business, they underperformed some of their selected peers, and the gap was potentially billions of dollars in value loss wow. because their employee discontent in, in uh, customers not wanting to go into the stores. Well, they reached a resolution where um, people who joined the union are go are intending are going to get back pay are going to get benefits that they've lost they're going to have a, an agreement to collectively bargain over time yeah. and so with that in mind the soc said we've accomplished a lot of our goals here and so we're going to withdraw the campaign it actually is a win for all sides ah, how about that now um bruce you and your team shared with me um, a statistic which i found very interesting um retail i guess it's 58% of U.S. households um, in 2022 own stocks, up from 53% in 2019. That's a big jump. What does that mean for activism? Well, it it is a big jump. And, and this is a, a kind of a history lesson almost, because when I got into the proxy solicitation business, we were at the tail end of equity ownership largely through people, yeah. individuals, and over time with the growth of the mutual funds and the index funds, institutional ownership far exceeded the individual ownership. Yeah. And I would meet 
people and I tell them I'm in the proxy solicitation business and they would say, oh, well, I get that material and I just throw it out. I never vote it. And I used to say, thank you. Because <laughs> what that meant was we had to go reach out to other people. Yeah. But over time, the business or the solicitation of shareholders became more institutional. Yeah. And there's a routine with reaching out to the institutions. Then we saw this Robin Hood effect. Yeah. And, and this is a sort of COVID effect, people staying home and buying shares. Yeah. And suddenly you have more and more people who own shares. And then you have some companies, and interestingly, Starbucks is one of them where they have well over a billion, I'm sorry, a million shareholders. Wow. And Disney, for example, yeah has millions of shareholders. Yeah. And so these are companies where those millions of shareholders also aggregate into a large percentage of the outstanding shares in excess of 25% more for Disney. And it means you have to reach out to these investors. And these investors now are an important component of the messaging to get a campaign done. You have to find a way to connect with somebody who doesn't have a requirement to vote who doesn't necessarily have it within their routine yeah. to vote. And so what it, what it ultimately means are we're seeing more campaigns where there's more outreach and messaging to the individuals than it used to be. And you're seeing more social media being used and you're seeing more of an impact through TV. Yeah. Any, any place where you can reach the individual in addition to sending them the proxy material or they get it by email. Most of the, most people get it by email these days. And you need to reach them. You need to reach them where they are. It means over their smartphones a lot of times. Uh, one, other, one other point on this uh, retail topic. Um, BlackRock has a platform that allows shareholders who want to, I guess, to vote rather than letting you know the, the firm vote on their behalf. Do mm -hmm. you think that's gonna um, do you think that's gonna have momentum? Do you think it'll be taken advantage of? Well, I don't know how much momentum it's going to have with the individuals because appreciate the reason so many individuals buy yeah. index funds is so that they don't have to right. be concerned with yeah. this kind of voting. However, I still think that that program of allowing voting choice will have significant impact on many campaigns because that same voting choice is going to the institutions who invest in, in BlackRock yeah. or other big index funds. And we, for example, at Starbucks, BlackRock may have voted one way, but um, let's say pension funds or union plans that invested through BlackRock would make their own decision. And actually, I'm making no implication that they would have voted yeah. differently, but on some issues, it could be different, and that can change the vote ultimately. To the extent that individuals are interested enough, it will move the needle a little bit. I don't think there's going to be a lot of take up or there will be some initial take up. And then I think regular old apathy of individuals will come into play and you're, you're not gonna see very much from the pure retail side, but it still will change. And then there, will be, and actually what, what will change is that you will see a diminution of voting power yeah. from the large firms because they're disaggregating. I think that is part of the reason yeah. that that the firms want to do it. It'll, it. It takes some criticism away that they have a outsized monolithic vote. Gotcha. Uh, just a couple more questions for you, Bruce. Um, I just wrote an article a couple of weeks ago about Gildan, which is a uh, company in Canada, yeah. and there were there's just so many. Now I w wouldn't call them all activists, but they're they're frustrated, and Investors. it's like seven of them or something, right? So is this a trend where you see multiple activists, you know, going after the same company? Well, it's it's a continuation. We we've have experienced many situations yeah. in the past few years where you have more than one activist involved in the same campaign. And as a firm where we work for both activists and companies, and we have an excellent stock surveillance group, we can see when more than one active investor is buying shares or building derivative positions. And then we experience when there is some event which allows for more vocalization of yeah. discontent that Really, I feel for the IR directors on those days. Um, and all of a sudden, you do see that the same kinds of thought process that drives the research brings 
similar kind of value-oriented investors into the same stock. And so, sure, then you have situations where there are more than one activist. I mean, it's not just in Canada. You see that with Norfolk Southern. Yeah. You see that with a number of companies where, you know, a, a, a good idea in terms of a company that is underachieving its value potential will be identified by more than one smart investor. Gotcha. All right. Last question, Bruce. And I, I might be dating us here talking about one of my favorite fights of all time, Darden. So, you know, that went all the way. They they you know they swept the board. That was wild. What I'm seeing more now are settlements. Um, what's your feel on that? Are boards afraid? I mean, it was like a decade ago now, but well, yeah. you know what I'm getting at. Are boards yeah. more willing to come to the negotiating table? Well, I think it's a it, it is a change, and that's due to a, a different sophistication in the market for activist and activism. And so, when Darden was uh, you know, when the Darden fight happened, yeah, there was less of a focus on the composition of your board. Yeah, there was let it from the management side. Management teams had fewer advisors. Yeah, um, who were helping them with the situation. I think we've seen a growth of the advisor market. Yeah. in that decade, so that more companies are getting more sophisticated counsel ah. so that companies now are, are not only saying, why do we want to have this proxy fight now? Yeah. Especially with a lot of other things going on at, at our company and maybe we're doing something. And I've actually had a number of situations where we've counseled clients to say, let's look at you know, the distraction versus where you are in your plan. Maybe you do want to share that information with an investor who can anchor the thought process for other investors and give you the, the runway to get where you want to go. And so I think it's, it's from both sides where a settlement works out. In a situation where we are going to proxy fights these days, it's where there are is just such a disagreement between the management team and the investor. And, and sometimes it's just pure stubbornness that you end up at a proxy fight that a management team doesn't want to allow somebody in. But more frequently now, we're seeing that the management side is saying, maybe we should settle. There's been this decade plus where we've been socialized with the investors, they've been on the board, they've been helpful in situations, so why fight? All right, we'll leave it there. This has been terrific. We covered a ton of ground. Thanks as always, Bruce. That was terrific. Always fun, John. Thanks. I'm John Janron, Editor-in-Chief of CorpGov, signing off from New Orleans, Louisiana.